Hey, how's it going? I'm Isla Golden and welcome to my vlog. Alright, okay, so um, this is probably come, come, going to come across as a little bit of a weird one. I have tried recording this one a couple of times already. Um, but every time I sort of get to the end of it, I feel like I've not been necessarily as clear as I could be with what I'm trying to say. Um, and I, maybe my point is getting a little bit muddled under other things. Um, I've had some time since the last time I recorded it to sort of clarify my thoughts on it a little bit more. And hopefully when I record this one, it will make a little bit more sense. Um, obviously it may not still. Um, but I'm hoping, you know sort of as I, as I sort of go through this and as I sort of um, explain myself as best I can that you'll kind of get what I'm, I'm trying to talk about here. Um, so as somebody who has still fairly recently come out as being non-binary um, it's very natural to sort of reflect back on your past and, and look at various things in your past um, you're basically just reflecting on the life that you've had so far um, to sort of come to terms with with everything that you that you've been through. Um, I would like to sort of like stress that I've never looked back at my past looking for signs that I was definitely non-binary because I already know those things are there, uh, not necessarily in uh, a way that might have been obvious to other people, but on a personal level, I was very much aware that from Quite a young child, um, I felt as though I had a secret identity that um, one day I would be able to reveal to the world. I just wasn't 100% sure what that secret identity was. I just knew from a very young age that it was there. Um, and uh, a lot of the games that I used to play, that I used to come up with, a lot of the, the fantasies that I used to have, well, all, 100%, <laughs> all of them were focused around the idea that I had a secret identity and that the person that I was presenting to the world, the person that people assumed I was, wasn't the real me. It was just this uh, facade that I used um, in order to hide my true secret identity. Um, and as an adult, since coming out, since uh, not just as being non-binary, but as being on the asexual spectrum as well, um, has allowed me to finally reveal my true self to the world and I no longer feel like I, I need that mask that I've been using since, since childhood but I was very much aware was always there. Um, I might not have known what the mask was there for um, and it's taken me a long time and a lot of um, introspection and a lot of experience to finally reach a place of going oh, now it all makes sense, now it all fits together, now I completely understand who I am and, and you know, why things are like this for me and why I, I felt this way about certain things. Um, so I've finally been able to take off the mask, but I was always aware that it was there. I was always aware that I was um, hiding behind this sit het identity that wasn't me, um, even if as a small child I didn't know that's what it was and as a teenager I was becoming more aware of what that was but I wasn't fully ready to embrace it yet and then during my 20s I did kind of I kind of knew what it was but I kind of buried it a little bit because the circumstances that I were in um, that I was in and that I was going through um, made me very cautious about embracing it um, and it was only once I reached my 30s when I was kind of like you know what I've got nothing to lose anymore um, I've, I've put myself through enough, I'm finally ready to take off the mask um, and finally embrace these parts of myself and fully embrace these parts of myself that I, you know, have been very much aware of throughout my life, even if my understanding of what it was um, has, you know, developed over time. Um, so for me, it's kind of like looking back on my childhood and looking back on my teenage years, what I'm looking at is the mask that I was using and the things that I was doing and the things that I was saying in order to kind of fit in with what other people were expecting from me and what other people were assuming about me based on what they believed was true. Um, 
So the, and I know this is going to be a very weird example, but one of the biggest examples from my point of view um, of, of this kind of having an idea projected onto me that I allowed to become true um, was around my favourite colour. Uh, so I'm sure you're thinking, well, that's, that's kind of weird. How, you know, what, what am I on about there? Um, so by the time I was five, I, per, on a personal level, was very, very, very aware that my favourite colour was red. Um, in all of those make-believe games that I used to come up with for my friends, where quite often I was playing a hero of some kind, I was always the red one. Uh, you know, if we, if we were super teddy bears, I was the red bear. If we were super animals, I was the red animal. Um, that was very much, you know, that was very much what it was. I, you know, with me, with my friends, I was the red one. That's, that was my identity. That was my hero identity. <laughs> as a child who liked coming up with hero games, um, I definitely didn't have a hero complex as a child. No, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but I also remember things like when I went to my, my grandmother's for a few days uh, just by myself because I think my brothers were unwell with something and it was to try and avoid me ca catching it. Um, we went out to get my niece some cereal and the Rice Krispies that they had at the time had this uh, pair of glasses that had like um, coloured lenses depending on which, which one it was. Um, and I wanted the red one. So even though I didn't like Rice Krispies, I assisted to get that and then I forced myself to eat Rice Krispies for several days um, <laughs> just because I wanted the red ones because they were red. Um, so yeah, you know, things like that make me as an adult and made me as a child very certain that my favourite colour was red. However, if you were to ask my family around that time and my family now reflecting back on that time they would have told you it was yellow uh and now i don't know where the idea that it was yellow originally came from i assume a much younger version of me probably said oh yellow is my favorite color uh because like all children all very young children your favorite color does and can change and fluctuate not all but a lot of very young children will say Oh, yellow is my favourite colour. And then the following day, it'll be like, oh, green is my favourite colour, because that's what children are like. They um, they adopt uh, ideas very, very quickly. Um, so I assume the slightly younger age than five, I once or twice said that yellow was my favourite colour. I think that was where it initially came from. Um, however, my family were very insistent. To, to me that my favourite colour was yellow. Um, I assume that when I initially tried correcting them, because I can't see why a small child wouldn't, because as I said, small children change their mind over what their favourite colour is a lot, and it wouldn't have been that unusual for a young child to go, no, it's red now, or something along those lines. Um, but I imagine the first couple of times I did that, I probably disappointed whoever it was that I said it to. And I can remember when I was getting slightly older and I did get a bit more, oh, but I also really like red, um, experiencing something similar. Whereas it wasn't necessarily that they were disappointed, I just also had to go, oh, but I still really like yellow too, because I could sort of, you know, tell that, you know, the idea that my favourite colour was red wasn't sitting quite right because they had this very clear picture of, of me in their mind as somebody who really liked yellow um, and as I said I don't know where it initially came from but I'm very much aware that I probably maintained that it was yellow despite knowing it was red because I didn't want to disappoint anybody and that very much sounds like the kind of child that I was and the kind of person that I am as well. I still hate disappointing people um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so even though, you know, as I said, I was very much aware that my favourite colour was, was red. And I liked it just because I liked red. Um, and I was always very, very, very annoyed at the fact that my brothers were the ones who got red as a choice of colour. Um, whenever they, you know, they had to choose between colours for things. And I always just got yellow kind of by default. Um, I never kind of resented yellow for that. It wasn't it wasn't yellow's fault. I said I don't know how or why. 
my family thought my favourite colour was yellow and then kind of got very insistent that it was yellow. It was just one of those things, it's just the kind of the way that it went. Um, I, I always found yellow a particularly happy colour, so I, as I said, I didn't, you know, resent getting lots of things in yellow and having lots of clothing items in yellow and being associated with yellow, but I still knew my favourite colour was red. And um, so as a, as a child, my kind of way of dealing with it was, okay, I will say that yellow is also my favourite colour. I will also make yellow my favourite colour. I will justify why it's there is my favourite colour, because I know it's not actually my favourite colour, but I will say that it is also my favourite colour, and it will become part of this mask, um, but that I was very much becoming aware that I was using. Um, and, you know, it's, it seems like such a simple little thing, um, you know, so especially kind of looking back on it, it's like, well, why didn't you be more insistent that your favourite colour was red? Why, why this, why that, why the other? And I think maybe part of it was because red was the, one of the colours that my brothers got to choose between, so it just made everybody's lives a lot easier. I liked yellow instead because it meant a lot less arguments and a lot less fights, and I could just be automatically assigned that colour and everybody would be happy. Um, and my brothers could just like choose between, you know, because they, they liked red as well. <laughs> um, and they could like alternate between, and I would just be left off of that equation because I would just make things a lot, you know, too complicated and too confusing for people. Um, so I don't think there was any sort of mal intent behind it. I don't think it was that insistent because that uh, insistence because you know I wasn't allowed to like red. Um, I think it was just it made life easier for everybody if. I wasn't also competing for the same colour as my brothers, and I had this colour of my own, uh, which was a nice, happy, cheerful colour, um, which, as I said, I didn't mind, um, and I was able to kind of go, okay, I'm going to make it also my favourite colour, um, whilst knowing, but no, red was, red was my real favourite colour, red was my proper favourite colour, and I just liked yellow because I needed to like yellow, and um, I have a lot, and because of that, I've got a lot of memories of uh, positive associations with yellow. I, as I said, I don't resent yellow as a colour. I still quite like yellow as a colour. It's a, it's a happy colour for me because I have a lot of, because I had a lot of yellow things, especially yellow clothing uh, for various things growing up. It means that a lot of events that were happy events, um, I associate with the colour yellow. So... Um, although it's still not my favourite colour, it is a nostalgic colour for me, it's a positive association colour for me. Um, however, it was also part of that mask that I was using as a child um, to make things easier for everybody else in some ways. And because I was still not, at, I was still at that stage of kind of embracing the mask um, and kind of embracing the fact that I needed to have a secret identity, that I needed to sort of hide the real me and, you know, present something that was that was safer. I mean, you know, I was sort of being bullied and teased for being different around this time anyway. So the idea of one less thing that, you know, um, one more mask doesn't really make much of a difference and, you know, not pushing the bow and not revealing just how different I was was very important as a child when I knew kind of instinctively that expressing myself as my true self would probably not end well for me <laughs> as a child who was being bullied in school. Um, so just adding this other layer to my mask of, okay, yeah, I'm going to stay yellow as my favourite colour even though that I know it's not. Um, just became this very natural thing to sort of do. And as I said, I think probably came about because the first time I said, no, it's actually red, I probably disappointed whoever it was that I, I said that to you, or I don't know, I felt like I would disappoint whoever it was that I said that to you. So I just sort of kept quiet and just kind of allowed people to say that yellow was my favorite color and assume that yellow was my favorite color. Even though by the time I was five, I knew it was red. Um, so yeah, that's that's the kind of thing that when you kind of look back on when I kind of look back on my on my youth and on you know my childhood and on my teenage years, it's one of those things that I can point to and go, 
okay, yeah, maybe from your point of view, I wasn't showing any obvious signs of, of being non-binary. Um, but I also wasn't telling you what my real favorite color was. <laughs> so how can you, you know, make the argument that it wasn't there when there was a lot about myself that I was keeping hidden and there was a lot about myself that I was keeping to myself uh, for various reasons. Um, I was aware that I had, you know, I was masking. I was aware of the fact that I was presenting someone to the world who, who wasn't necessarily my true self, um, you know, even to the point where, and, and you know, this is this is something that, I, you know, my mum is very much aware of, um, I didn't talk about the fact that, you know, I was being bullied in school and that I, I would mask that as well. I would just, you know, get on with things and, and not, you know, try not to let it get to me too much and, you know, try not to react to it too much. Um, and my mum only really found out that I was being bullied at school because a lot of other things kind of built up and I had a bit of temp tantrum and it sort of came out that way. Um, but up until that point, my mum wouldn't have, wouldn't have known anything because as a child, I was incredibly good at masking things. I was incredibly good at not talking about things. I was incredibly good at allowing people to assume things about me and then just projecting that back. and using like the you know my favorite color thing as an example uh because as i said that's one of the ones that that sticks out most to me as an adult when i kind of look back on things um it, it just kind of goes to show that yeah okay um a lot of young trans children a lot of young non-binary children don't necessarily know that's what they are um and it will take them a long time to kind of realize what is different about them um, and to start, you know, acting in ways where, you know, it, it becomes a lot more obvious, um, you know, that they are non-binary or that they are that they are trans. Um, but just because there aren't really, really obvious signs from a young age, from an outsider perspective, doesn't mean there weren't signs for that child um, from an internal perspective, because, you know, as I said, some children just don't like disappointing people, so they'll go along with something that they know isn't necessarily the truth about them because it makes somebody else happy and that can have an impact on how, you know, how they sort of perceive themselves. And as I said, the impact it had on me was I knew I had a, a you know, that I knew I wasn't being my real, true, authentic self. I wouldn't have been able to tell you what my real, true, authentic self was at that age. <laughs> but I knew that's not who I was. And I knew some a day would come where I would finally be able to embrace the real me. Um, I didn't know how long it would take to get there. <laughs> but I knew, you know, I knew the person that I was presenting to the world, even at that age, even as a young child, was not my true self, was not my real self. Um, so there was still an awareness there, even if I couldn't have put it into actual words, even if I couldn't have put it into actual thoughts, even if, you know, I just, you know, assumed it was to do with all the fantasy stuff that I like to create and make up. There was still a part of me that was aware. But just because there was a part of me that was aware doesn't mean that I would have acted in a way that would have made it obvious, doesn't mean that I would have, you know, talked about things in a way that would have made it obvious because I definitely fall into that category of trans and non-binary um, where it's taken me a long time to fully realize who I am um, opposed to being very much aware of it as, as a child and you know different people will become aware of, of their identities in different ways and at different times um, and for different reasons and there is no right or wrong way for people to become aware of things but at the same time once you do become aware of things it's very natural to become very self-reflective and to look back on your past and to recontextualize these things that you knew were true of you back then mm -hmm. um, in a way where you can kind of go oh maybe it wasn't this big obvious thing like it is for some, but it was there. It, you know, it. I may finally made sense of this thing that did not make sense at the time. And part of that, again, for me, is looking back and going, 
one of the things I knew that I was doing was I was putting on, on a mask, I was putting on um, a persona, and one of the ways that I put on this persona was agreeing that my favourite colour was yellow, even though I knew my favourite colour was red, because of whatever reason that had made sense to me at the time, that I can't remember now as an adult. Um, but it, it can be simple things like that, and I think, you know, um, speaking to anybody who has maybe recently found out that a uh, somebody that they have watched growing up is trans or non-binary and then they've recently come out and you're kind of going well, how did I miss the signs how did I not know um how you know wouldn't it have been obvious wouldn't there have been like this that and the other and, and my answer to that is no because children are very very good at masking things if they feel like they need to mask things or if they're not aware enough um to contextualize their their thoughts and feelings in a way where they're kind of like oh no it's definitely this and a lot of children aren't um and there's nothing wrong with with them not knowing right away because that you know people learn about themselves as they grow up and it's part of a process it's all part of a process and people will approach that process in different ways and people will come to terms with things at different times and in different ways um the fact that you didn't notice anything when they were growing up doesn't mean there wasn't anything there it just means that it wasn't something that you were able to notice because it wasn't something they were actively projecting um but it doesn't mean there weren't things that were going on internally that they were trying to process and they were trying to come to terms with and they couldn't quite understand um, all that they were trying to mask. Um, so yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I hope that kind of makes sense um, and you kind of understand that although, you know, the very specific thing that I'm talking about isn't, you know, necessarily identity related in terms of transness and non-binariness. Um, but it is a very good example of how good kids can be at doing and saying things um, that they know personally aren't true about themselves, um, but they are doing it because it makes other people happy and they play into assumptions that other people have about them because it makes those other people happy. and sometimes that's the reason why signs can be missed um even though you know that child is probably doing it because they don't necessarily know what it is they are masking but they know they are masking something they know they're they are hiding something um but they don't necessarily understand what um and sometimes it, that might not even be the case it might might not not, not necessarily be a tangible thing for them but yeah it's very very easy for young children to lie about parts of their identity, <laughs> even if it's as simple as their favourite colour, for the sake of not disappointing other people, and for the sake of peace, and for the sake of a lot of things. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this version of it makes the most sense out of any versions of this that I have done so far. Um, I know it probably feels a little bit tangenty in places, I hope um, that, you know, anybody watching this can sort of understand what I'm trying to say with this and understand, you know, what my perspective is with this um, and that, yeah, I, I do fully understand that not all, um, not all individuals who grow up and discover that they are trans or non-binary will have experienced something like this when they were younger. Um, some might have similar experiences, some might have just known and all of those things are completely valid. There is no right or wrong, wrong way to discover who you are. There's no right or wrong time to discover who you are. You know, um, then it's all a process. It's and everybody goes through that process differently in their own time and in their own way. I'm just saying that part of the process that I went through um, very much involved me masking a lot of things when I was a child, um, including you know flat out lying about what my favourite colour was for the sake of other people um and you know that's probably an experience that others have probably had similar um similar things too you know some you know some probably have very different experiences and it's all valid and it's all fine and it's all fair 
um, this is just, you know, the experience that I've had and the thoughts that I've had about it as an adult. And as I said, the colour example is just the clearest example that I can give. Um, there are plenty of other examples that, you know, I've, I've thought about and it's just that it's like the colour one is the one that I kind of go, yeah, that like this is very clear. This is, you know, very clear that, you know, yes, this was my favourite colour, but yes, this is what I said was my favourite colour. And it's the one that sticks out the clearest in my mind as an example to give all this. But there are plenty of other examples when I was growing up where I knew that what I was saying and agreeing to wasn't necessarily the whole truth. It was just easier for me to, to say or agree to these things uh, because I was still very much in the stage of, I knew I had a sacred identity, but I didn't know what that identity was. Um, so yeah, I hope that all makes sense. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this one and found this one sort of interesting and maybe have taken away something from this. Um, I hope you're looking forward to seeing whatever it is I'm going to be talking about next time and I will see you next time. See ya! <laughs> if you've enjoyed this video, consider checking out some of my others and if you like what you see, consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching. See ya!